Good morning. Welcome to worship at Northminster Presbyterian Church. I'm Reverend Jenny Carlson. Happy Father's Day to those who are fathers or who celebrate their fathers on this day. Uh, we have a couple of announcements before we get going. Um, the first is uh, we don't have anybody signed up for coffee hour, so there won't be a coffee hour today, um, but that's okay. That kind of happens in, in summer sometimes. People are just busy. So um, I am going to be on vacation next week, so you will not see me next Sunday. You will have uh, Dustin here to preach, and then I actually will be gone for two Sundays because the following Sunday uh, is Pride Sunday, and I will be uh, helping to lead the uh, affirming churches of the Presbytery in a combined march. Uh, if you are interested in joining us, we will be gathering at 1215 that morning. So, or I guess it's afternoon by that point. Um, so if you would like to march with us, um, let me know. I will give you the exact address of where to meet. Uh, we will meet at 1215. We have to all be there collectively by 1245. Uh, there's no late entry so if you once our group is gathered nobody can come and like join us as we're walking along so you have to kind of just come at that time so if you're interested in walking with us uh let me know i will get all of that information to you um and if you don't want to march in the parade you will get to hear martine that week so um so i will be out of the pulpit for the next two weeks um but i will be in the office as of the 24th so i'll only be on vacation for an actual week um but that said, we do have Bible study tomorrow. Uh, it's going to be led by Dustin, so you'll have an opportunity to kind of see what Bible study with him is like uh, as he prepares for uh, his sermon that week. Uh, and then we also have uh, this week uh, an event that Martine is going to tell you about. All right, how many of you know about Juneteenth? Something they didn't teach in schools even when I was in school in the 80s and 90s. Uh, but a uh, good piece of history for us to be aware of. And it also coincides with uh, the uh, tradition of barbecuing. So we're going to do our first barbecue this summer. We're gonna invite the shelter guests to come up and have some hot dogs and hamburgers. But we're also gonna theme it around to sort of, sort of learning more about this holiday Juneteenth, which is when the uh, last people who were enslaved in the United States in Texas were given the, the information, they were then free. So it's a great theme to, for the church to celebrate, uh, given that it's freedom. Um, so please come. Uh, we're, I'll probably start the grill like 4 or 4.30ish, but we'll probably go for two or three hours. We'll see. It just depends on how the weather is and how many people are hungry. And maybe we'll have some, um, some fun activities for the kids. Maybe we'll have them run around the playground see who can deliver the message first of the freedom of the, of, for the folks who were enslaved. I don't know, I was just uh, off the cuff. Um, I'd also like to mention that last week uh, I uh, signed a contract with a plumbing company who's gonna come and redo our pipes. So we don't have a date yet, but they actually assured us it's gonna be a pretty quick job. So despite the, the, uh, the amount of concrete that'll have to be moved, we're actually going to have to re remove the bottom set of stairs in the stairwell over here so that we can get to the pipes. So, um, and thank goodness they're wooden, which I was really scared. It was gonna be more concrete. But um, yeah, so Best Plumbing is going to be doing our work for us. We're gonna be letting other constituencies know that preschool will be out of, uh, out of um, meeting. They won't be meeting anymore because it'll be summer break. But um, there'll be other you know, maybe our parties that are affected like an A and stuff. So we're gonna let them know, but I just wanna let you all know today and we'll probably announce it next week so that you all aren't surprised if you show up and things are a little messier than usual. There will be a large pit in the front um, and we are really not sure about whether or not that tree is going to be an issue, the one right outside of our narthex, which Carol just pointed out there's a little bird's nest in there. So we're just like, oh no. So uh, yeah, we're, you can literally open the, the stained glass windows up in the narthex and, or in the balcony and hear the little birds chirping. So I'm like, okay, hopefully we don't have to remove that tree. But um, anyways, praise the Lord for, uh, for that. Thank you. Are there any other announcements? Okay. Uh, and just to expand on that, once we know the actual dates, um, if there's any reason why we need to uh, move our worship, um, we would probably uh, ask 
uh, Woodland Park if we can worship in their space on a Sunday. Uh, we don't yet have those details just because we're not yet on the plumber's calendar. Uh, and the main reason would just be without water, we'd have no bathroom services and stuff, and I would hate to make you all show up and then have to hold it the whole time you're in worship. <laughs> that just doesn't sound fun. So, so once we know for sure what the actual dates are and have it all, we will definitely be blasting that very, very clearly for everyone so that you'll know uh, when things are shut down and when they're not. So hopefully it'll all go fast and smooth. All right, let's go ahead and take in a deep breath and settle our hearts and our minds, remembering that we have been loved since before the foundation of the world. So let us worship God. Good morning. Good morning. Please stand if you are able to the call for worship. In your wisdom, O oh God, you call us here to worship you. We gather alive to the word of God. You call us to be fully alive with your abundant life, ready to listen and respond with heart, soul, strength, and mind. We listen alive to the word of God. You call us to be always watchful for your word of wisdom, sometimes startling, sometimes unexpected, sometimes still and quiet, but always dwelling among us. We watch and wait for the word of God.
may be seated. Now it's time for us to read together the prayer of confession. Please join me. Holy God, we groan at our weaknesses and we ask forgiveness. Your word is so clear and your grace is so good, but we close our ears to your call and with our perverse pride, we foul the gifts you have given us. We mistreat those we love and we dishonor you, the one who made us. How long, O Lord, will we continue to ignore your will? Yet you provide streams of living mercy. You invite us again and again to live renewed lives. We seek your forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We draw upon your promises and we ask once again simply for mercy. Hear our prayer, O Lord, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Creator God, no matter our family of origin, we are reminded today that we all have been adopted into your family. People of God, rest assured in the promises God has made to us to never leave us, forsake us, to be with us, save us, and be the source of our peace. Amen. to our time of the passing of the peace. And so I will begin by, um, no, I don't, okay, it doesn't look like we have anybody on phone today, which uh, we did earlier, but I guess they've moved on. Maybe it's Father's Day brunches and things. Um, so uh, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please turn to one another and exchange a sign of peace. And those of you who are joining on Zoom, go ahead and type your blessings of peace into the chat. Peace to all from Julia, peace to all from Lori, 
Peace and blessings to all from Katie Tynan. God's peace and blessings to everyone from Charlotte. Love and peace to all from Winona. Nope, it's over. Take your time. Literally fresh. <laughs> Let us pray. O oh God, our guide, set your path clearly before us and lead us to follow you willingly for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The first lesson is the first book of John, chapter 1, verses 5 to 10. Am I echoing? I can't. Uh, it sounds probably like it's a little loud, so just step back from the mic. Okay. <clears throat> this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. No one here to guide you Now you're on your own Only me beside you Still you're not alone alone truly no one is alone sometimes people leave you halfway through the wood Others may deceive you, you decide what's good, you decide alone, but no one is alone, people make mistakes, Fathers, mothers, people make mistakes holding to their own, thinking they're alone. Honor their mistakes, everybody makes. mistakes which is can be right giants can be good you decide what's right you decide what's good just remember someone is on your side 
Any kids want to come forward and have a little story with me? Petra, I wonder if you remember this story from the Bible. Do you think you do from the picture? We've talked about it a couple of times this year. Do you remember it? It's okay if you don't, you can say no. You don't remember it? Well, good news, I'm gonna read it to you. Jesus spent many hours teaching people about God and how God loves us all. One day, when Jesus was tired and resting, some parents arrived with their children. The children were giggling and laughing and running around making noise while their parents asked the disciples if they could speak with Jesus. What do you want with Jesus, asked the disciples. We want him to bless our children, they said. Jesus is resting, the disciples said. You can't bother him now. Go away. But Jesus heard them. Do not chase away the children, he said. Let them come to me. For God loves children, and when they smile, God smiles. When they laugh, God laughs, and when they cry, God cries. Jesus went to the children and they laughed and played together for a while. Jesus took them in his arms and he hugged them and placed his hands on their heads and blessed them. Then he told the disciples, everyone who wants to see God's dream come true must see it with the eyes of a child. Isn't that a nice story? What does that tell, story tell us? That children are as important as adults. That is exactly right. I think that deserves some applause, don't you? <laughs> that's exactly right. And we think that's very important here, don't we? Here at, at Northminster. Some churches, they don't think that's important, but we think that's very important here, that children are as important as adults. And sometimes I think it's important for adults to remember to, like the story says, see through the eyes of kids and remember that 
everything can be new and exciting sometimes. We get used to everything being the same, but sometimes we need to remember to look at things fresh and new. Would you like to tell, say a prayer with me? I have a special one today that I... Let's pray. Grace and peace to you, our children. We will always give thanks for you. We pray for you constantly because we love you. We love you just as God loves you. We know, children of God, that God loves you so much. There are no words to express it. There are no wonders we can perform, but we know that the power of God is in you. We can see it upon our faces. You remind us of God's love. Teach us to see the world as you do. Surprise us with the wonders you see. Show us what gifts God has given you and we will bless you and protect you, and we will always give thanks for you. We will bless you in the name of our God. We will bless you again and again. Grace and peace to you, our children. Grace and peace to you who show us God's glory shining through your face. Amen. Thank you for spending this time with me. Now we're going to listen to Pastor Jenny tell us a story. Thank you, Dustin. And thank you, too, for your uh, vocal performance. It's one of my favorite musicals, so that was beautiful. Our second reading today comes from the letter to the Ephesians. Uh, we are in chapter 4 and reading verse 14 through 16. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, and very quickly, before I read the next session, section of the uh, confession or the declaration of Barman, um, I just wanted to draw attention on the bulletin covers uh, throughout this series. There are two uh, banners. And for every confession that we have in the Presbyterian Church USA, there is a banner that was created to symbolize it. Um, some churches actually display all of them within their sanctuary, um, but going all the way back to the first confession, the Scots Confession, which came out of our formation in Scotland, um, all the way up to the De Declaration of Belhar, which is um, the one with the continent of Africa on the front cover there, every single confession has a uh, banner. and so that's that's what those two things are. So the banner with the crossed out swastika is for the Declaration of Barman and the other one is for the Confession of Belhar. So I just wanted to uh, alert you to that in case you didn't know. All right, this is section three of the Declaration of Barman. The Christian church is the congregation of the brethren in which Jesus Christ acts presently as the Lord in word and sacrament through the Holy Spirit. As the church of pardoned sinners, it has to testify in the midst of a sinful world, with its faith as with its obedience, with its message as with its order, that it is solely God's property and that it lives and wants to live solely from God's comfort and from God's direction in the expectation of Christ's appearance. We reject the false doctrine as though the church were permitted to abandon the form of its message and order to its own pleasure or to changes in prevailing ideological and political convictions. Now, one of my uh, favorite people to watch go on a rant 
is Dr. McCoy from the original Star Trek. His tirades against the risk that the crew were about to take are absolutely legendary, especially when the issue at hand is his take on whatever medical practices that we might see as being the forefront of medical science, but are regarded as primeval to this fictional doctor from 200 years in the future. Uh, see the uh, Star Trek IV movie for an, a great example of that. Uh, and while Star Trek never had to actually explain why it is this little handheld device could just like wave over someone's broken arm or leg and the bone would magically heal or new organs could grow in a matter of minutes, we really didn't need that to make sense for us because we just figured, okay, at some time in the future, maybe it will be that easy. After all, when we look at even our most recent past, we can be a little horrified by what we used to believe was good for our health. About a half century ago, smoking cigarettes used to be enthusiastically recommended by doctors for calming nerves or easing pain. Coca-Cola has its name because cocaine was an actual ingredient and was sold in everyday stores as a sort of cure-all tonic uh, and uh, that cured all sorts of things. And in our current opioid epidemic, it exists in no small part due to the medical establishment being told that pain management was essential for healthcare and these new slow release morphine based drugs would somehow be magically non addictive. The same is true for vape pens and jewel pods, which were supposed to cure smoking, but ended up addicting an entirely new generation of kids. Not every idea is a good idea. As some ideas are actually evil ideas disguised as good ones, perpetrated by those who most of the time want money or power, particularly in the case of the opioid epidemic. That's a really great example of recent times when that has happened. And our scripture today tells us straight up that this phenomenon isn't actually new. As long as there have been people, there have been those blessed with gifts of incredible charisma, and whether that gift is used to help people or hurt them is often not known for a while. Especially when we find that we have been duped. If we've been duped, it is easier to want to hide or to act as though we haven't been duped at all, thus continuing to give them power. In her book, Attack from Within, How Disinformation is Sabotaging America, attorney and law professor Barb McQuaid explains why it is we struggle with this, and that it's not simply a matter of those people in the past just not knowing any better. She writes, Human nature plays all sorts of tricks on us. When we are uncertain or uneasy, we become susceptible to persuasion and manipulation. Cognitive forces like confirmation bias, conformity bias, and others all conspire to make us ripe for deception. So when we are desperate for a treatment, we can be less critical when someone steps forward and authoritatively tells us, I have a way to ease your suffering. Give me all your money and I can give you a cure. When we're struggling financially, we are more willing to seek the get rich quick kind of scheme. The more fearful or uncertain we are, the harder it is for us as individuals to question or think critically, which is why we need each other. It's also why we need diversity, because group fear or group uncertainty can end up being disastrous for us. Now, both in the John letter and in the Ephesians letter, we encounter a church that is struggling with what it believes, to whom it's going to give its authority, and how do we wrestle with the things that we don't yet or may never understand? And while for some people, the church is actually seen as the biggest dealer of misinformation there is, there is no other institution in history that delves into these deep issues of belief than religious ones. 
We have been having these conversations for thousands of years. And in our first reading, we start from the start of this letter in John, the question is being asked, how do we understand the world as we experience it and the world as it has been revealed to us by God? God is light, and in God there is no darkness at all. For a people without electricity, the difference between the light of day and the darkness of night is visceral and literal. It's survival. So this metaphor, which carries a wide swath of meanings, begins with safety and security. From there, we attach concepts of goodness and love of transparency to our understanding of light and therefore of God. Many things about our identity as a faith community come from this understanding of what light means and how we use it to manage or navigate the dark together. And that togetherness is where the writer takes us next. And while the language of sin permeates in this letter, what the unknown community or communities that are being addressed here, what they're struggling with is this deep debate about who Jesus was and is and what his life and death meant for them. They are actively working out what does it mean to be Christian. And they don't have a whole book of scriptures to guide them. So what the writer wants them to focus on, not just in these verses, but actually throughout this whole letter is one, God is good. And two, pay attention to where these divisions are taking you so that we have the opportunity to see when the bad idea is starting to gain traction among us. If we have fellowship with one another, then Jesus has our back. The letter writes, if we try to say that the other side is absolutely wrong, i.e. sinful, and we are absolutely right, as in no sin over here, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Basically, the letter is telling us you need to be humble with this process. We need to listen and to remember that we love God and love each other foremost. We are meant to seek out what is good and God will guide us from there. This idea is echoed in the Ephesians letter. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro, but speaking truth in love, we must grow up. The whole body joined and knit together, building itself up in love. The church at Ephesus is being warned because the charlatan and the scheming never goes away. It may even come directly from within us. But when we slow down, when we don't allow ourselves to be fearful or anxious, when we remember that we are called to love each other and center ourselves in the light and love of God as the place where we find truth and difficulty, that is when we will find our way. And that is the incredible wisdom that is displayed in this section of the commission at Barman and is, so, is summed up so beautifully here. The church is the congregation of the brethren of Jesus Christ. Through the Holy Spirit, Jesus moves within and among us, guiding, teaching, and inspiring us. We reject the false doctrine as though the church were permitted to abandon the form of its message in order to its own pleasure or changes in prevailing ideological and political convictions. Our confession tells us that we are supposed to be critical thinkers. The church or churches that John is writing to, they're asking each other hard questions 
And the answers are not coming easy. So they are sitting in this space of deep discernment. The way of Jesus was upending thousands of years of theology and religious practices at the time. So they were right to question that. Jesus himself encouraged that practice as evidence and conversations he had both with the disciples and with random people, usually women, that he came across. He wanted people to think, to ask, to prayerfully reflect on what he was teaching. Even Jesus himself didn't walk through the world with absolute certainty. The examples we have of his own prayers in scripture prove that he had his own questions that he would lay before God. Yet there are so many Christian leaders or churches or believers who will see doubt and question as some kind of threat. You know who else does that? Autocrats and dictators, the very people that the Declaration of Barman is addressing specifically. The marriage of nationalism with that kind of unquestioning, absolute certainty Christianity is how we get to what the church is wrestling with now in this white Christian nationalism movement. See, many centuries ago, the questions that drove us apart were ones of baptism and communion and who was saved and who wasn't. But now it's questions of sex and gender and bodily autonomy and social structure. In the past century, we have seen our inability to humbly have these discussions well lead people away from the church entirely. In fact, I believe that many in the church thought it was better to drive them away than to have to deal with our own misunderstandings, our own doubts, and our own misinformation. We did the exact opposite of what these scriptures that we read today told us to do. As a big C church, particularly the American church, we have been blown about by every wind of doctrine that can tell us who we can and cannot love, which gender can teach and preach, that God cares more about our sexual purity than our hearts and relationships, that only one class of people, straight, white, cisgendered American males, have been blessed by God to rule the church and therefore those outside it. We are walking in the darkness of that lie, while claiming that we have no sin, deceiving ourselves. And so the truth is not in us. I'm saying this as the global church. Churches are shrinking everywhere, and rather than confess our sins, we are doing what verse 10 says. If we say that we have not sin, we make God a liar, and God's word is not in us. And my friends, people have noticed. <laughs> they have noticed and they have walked away because their own lived truths, the light of God, that God is good and loving, all of those truths that are inside them was pointing them away from the place that was harming them and limiting their relationship with God to this narrow view of what some say God thinks and wants and approves of and tolerates, as if God didn't already knowingly create each of us. And while this church specifically has had many of these difficult discussions, we are a part of this body, joined and knit together by every ligament. So we can't just sit back and say, well, that's not us. Because I promise you that there are churches in this city, even in this presbytery, and sometimes even within these walls that do think that way. Like any other sin, we hide them in the darkness, which for most of us means that we just don't talk about them. Maybe you believe that abortion is wrong, but in Seattle, you don't bring that up. 
Maybe you don't believe that three people could be in a committed relationship or that the Bible speaks against that. Maybe it offends you to see a man dressed in what you believe are the clothes that only a woman should wear. I use those examples because all of them have come up during my time in this community. And none of those situations are made better by not talking about them. But often we don't, or we have very stilted conversations because we don't approach them from a place of, help me understand. Rather, we allow the fear to overtake us. We let our own offendedness lead us to confrontations or ultimatums instead of letting love lead us to curiosity, to sincere questions, to discernment and reflection. Friends, as Christians, we are called to move through the world like Christ, being the light and love of God to a world that is too often doused in darkness. That what the original commission Jesus gave to the 12 disciples it is the same commission that continues to us. In an age when your friends may ask, why do you even still go to church? Or how can you continue to identify with a religion that has done so much harm and appears to have a desire to take over the country? Then a life of genuine discipleship may feel for you impossible. But my dear ones, the mission, should you choose to accept it, is actually far easier than you realize. You just have to love. Not sure what scripture means? Look for the love. Not sure if some behavior is acceptable? Ask if it's loving. Don't know how to talk to that person whose views you can't stand and talking to them makes you crazy? Love them. Find yourself wrestling, wrestling with a change or a teaching or a value that is dividing you from others. Love yourself enough to be curious and work through it. And if you're still sitting there thinking, I don't know, that really seems impossible. That, my friends, that is why we need God. Please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, as we wrestle with issues of conscience, issues of deeply held beliefs, perhaps that have been with us since childhood, Perhaps we see things changing faster than we feel we can adapt to. Or maybe they're not changing fast enough. Lord, we know that you are with us in all of that. And that your desire for us is not that we step away or separate or divide or seek out the only church that will agree with everything that we believe in but rather that we are meant to continue to talk, to ask questions not from a place of convincing other people we are right, but from being open to all the ways in which we might be wrong. And Lord, we know this is difficult. As we move into General Assembly, there are questions we should be wrestling with as a church, such as issues of mass incarceration, of hunger and homelessness, of the ways in which immigrants are treated at the border, and yet the issue that is front and center on every post about General Assembly is over whether or not we're going to discriminate openly against LGBT people, as so though that is the only thing we care about. And so, Lord, we just ask that we can all be in a space where we can breathe, where we can be unfearful and unanxious, 
that we can believe and trust in your love enough to hear where it is you are guiding us. And that we can love each other enough to know that we're all here because of you. That you have placed a calling on our hearts and asked that we gather. So my friends, let us breathe in the depth of God. And God, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be among us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Friends, as creator, God made us and knows us fully. When we bring our full selves to God and admit our imperfections, we are show letting God shine through us. We thank the God for all of our gifts, each and every one, for those that we recognize and those that we don't. And we pray that all of these gifts will be used for the building up of God's kingdom. May it be so.
Please be seated. We come to our times of the prayer of the people, so I'll pray collectively for us, and then if you have prayer requests, go ahead and speak them aloud. And those of you who are joining us on Zoom this morning, you can type your prayer requests into the chat, and then we'll close together with the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we come before you today with open hearts. We know that there is so much that is happening within our community and within our world. We see violence on TV every day. We see changes happening around us. We see the grief and the difficulty. And it is at times very difficult, Lord, for us to hold all of those things. Yet it is in this place where we can breathe in deep your Holy Spirit, where we can know that you sit with us most assuredly, that in those moments of uncertainty and fear, in those moments of joy and pure amazement, that you sit with us, that you know what is in our hearts, that you guide and inspire us. And Lord, we ask that in those even difficult moments, that you gently remind us that we are to love you and to love each other. And therefore we are to see the light of you in everyone that we meet. Lord, we know that there are so many concerns that we carry each day. And so we lift those before you now, knowing that you hear all, whether spoken aloud or not. Lord, we lift up prayers for Auden, uh, Julia's child, who's going to be starting a counseling job at a camp for mentally disabled children in New York. Lord, we just pray for safe travels for Auden, for them to be able to have all of the peace and love that they require to work with this um, particular population. And Lord, we thank you for inspiring them to this work. And we are grateful that they have stepped up and are seeing this as part of their life's direction as they are studying this in college, I know too. So Lord, we just offer prayers of blessing and protection and guidance over Autumn this summer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we offer up prayers for fathers, stepfathers, those who have served the role of being a father-like influence to people. We know that with our parents, sometimes our memories are conflicted. Sometimes our fathers died or went away when we were very young. And so these things can both be incredible blessings of opportunity. They can be sometimes painful and sometimes they can even impact our relationship with you. But we are thankful for all those who have taken on the role, those who have loved and cared for children and for the people in their midst. And we are eternally grateful for all um, who fill that fathering role the same way that Joseph did for you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So Lord, let us lift together in one voice, saying the prayer that you taught us. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
Please stand and we will sing together um, hymn number 722. Our God, in their great love, created you just exactly the way you're supposed to be. Jesus Christ, in his great love, emblazes your way. And the Spirit, in her great love, emboldens you to go forth in just peace to love and serve our God and one another. May it be so. Amen. Amen.